we're going to head to the book of Isaiah, chapter number 58. So we're going to spend our time together. There is a Franciscan blessing Amen. that um, I did not get a chance to print out um, on my slide that I wanted to just um, offer as bookends for this message today in light of all of the many things that uh, may be weigh weighing heavily on our minds. Um, and so I, I'm going to read it, and I'm going to invite you to just close your eyes and allow the words of this blessing. It is thought to have been uh, written well over a millennia ago um, as a part of, if you're familiar with the Franciscans, they are a uh, order or a classification of priests or those within the Catholic uh, Christian tradition, if you will, who uh, had a very clear and intense sense of the intersection of God's justice and the injustice in the world. They, they had this sensibility that uh, to be a follower of Jesus, to be in the ministry of the gospel was not just uh, about um, spiritual practices, liturgical practices, but it was also about helping to make right in creation that which has been undone because of humanity's inability to live within and in line with God's original intents. And so this, these words are words that uh, I stumbled upon in my study and they, they really blessed me. And so I want to offer them to us um, and then read them again uh, during our time of altar call response. But these are the words, uh, hear these words. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. May God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. If you receive that blessing, amen. Somebody just say, I receive it. Somebody say, so let it be. Somebody else say, and it is so. Isaiah chapter number 58 is uh, our passage. It is a passage that I normally preach uh, at the beginning of our consecration. It is a passage that um, over the years I've preached uh, to help remind us of the true reason and impact of why we fast. And as I was thinking about what to preach this morning in light of uh, things that are happening, not just in the world, but in the life of our church, I thought about this passage perhaps being a powerful bookend to our consecration. For it is the case that uh, the practices of our faith, and we are this year uh, making it very intentional to lean into uh, what we're calling rooted in our disciplines, rooted in this idea that we have practices, we have disciplines, we have uh, tools that as followers of Jesus, we can lean into to help us navigate through the vicissitudes, the challenges, the ups, the downs, the, 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 the triumphs and the defeats of our lives. It is a reality that Many of us know very little about our own faith tradition. We know what we have learned as we've grown up in church, amen, and, and, and we have our caricatures, we have our, you know, stories, we have all these different things, but I want you to know that our faith, our tradition is a, 
uh, you know, several thousands year long tradition that has so many kinds of practices that can be a, a tool, a reservoir, a deep well that you and I can literally draw strength from no matter what stage of life we're in. And, and part of what I love about the consecration is that it certainly gives you and I a deep dive into, you know, uh, this one practice of fasting, but I hope it also gives you and I a doorway into the other ways in which we have not just for the first month or 21 days of the year, this discipline that hopefully unleashes the spiritual power that is inherent in every believer, but that you have some practices that you can continue to, to use as, as maintenance for your spiritual journey. Can you imagine if you, uh, you know, that own a car only went to the mechanic uh, when your car literally broke down? I mean, you know, one could argue that may be a little too late. I mean, it's a good time, like ain't no time like the present. But if you want to have your automobile operating at optimal operation, you have maintenance along the way. Or, you know, I don't want to, you know, get even more personal about personal maintenance, amen, but, you know, uh, we have dentists for a reason. Somebody say amen. amen. We have therapists for a reason. Somebody say amen. amen. We have, you know, doctors and checkups for a reason. And for many of us, I'm one of these folks, I usually like to be so busy that it takes an act of God to get me to take care of something before it falls all the way apart. But how many of you know that it don't have to be that way? That there are practices, there are benchmarks, there are seasons. And this particular passage, the book of Isaiah, is written to a, a group of, 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 of uh, Jewish folks who are coming out of their bondage experience. They are trying to get back to rebuilding life pre their exile. You know, Haggai, the passage we've been preaching from around do it for the glory and the glory awaits. Today we're going to talk about how to unleash the glory. It is all a similar theme in the writers of the scripture. They're trying to figure out how do we build a life worth living? How do we rebuild that which the enemy has torn apart? How do we sustain what God has placed in our hands and not squander it? And these practices I want to submit to you, these, these, these disciplines that we have introduced in and will continue to roll out for this year is a great way for you and I to become much more conscious of the tools within your reach. I was watching uh, Batman and, and Superman cartoon last night on my way to bed, and I'm just always captivated by Superman's uh, otherworldly strength. And always so intrigued by Batman's uh, 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 tool belt, where he always has an answer to a problem. I want you to know, child of God, that the more you and I can lean into the resources of our tradition, we need not depend only on the otherworldly strength of the spirit that lives within, but we can also tap into the tools that God has placed within the life of faith that can help sustain and maintain us along the way. Isaiah 58, we're going to do a little bit of reading, first 12 verses. Uh, I, I invite you to join along with us. I believe we're in the New International Version. The scripture simply says it like this, shout it aloud and do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. Verse number two, for day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right. 
don't know if we describe in the United States today, amen. Uh, uh huh. But 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 they have not and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted? They say, and you have not seen it. Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? This is the children of Israel. They're they're trying to figure out how come we're doing all these spiritual disciplines and 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 God, you're not responding to our prayers. How come we are engaging in all these rituals and practices and God, it seems like you're not taking notice. God responds, yet on the day of your fasting, you still do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Man, God's given them some corrective, loving advice. We're going to keep on reading. Verse number five, is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day that is acceptable to the Lord? Or is not this the kind of fast that I, God is speaking, have chosen to loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords or the bands of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood i know some of y'all like but you don't know my flesh and blood pastor mike praise god well you know verse number eight god says if you do all these things then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then will you call the Lord and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and the Lord will say, here am I. If you do away with the yoke of the oppressed, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. The Lord will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never failed, and your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations, and you will be called repairer of broken walls, restorers of streets with dwellings. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. All right, so we're going to talk for a few moments just on this continued topic around the glory of the Lord, that this is how we unleash the glory. Let's pray. God, bless the word that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And as I stand to teach and preach your word, send your anointing that makes it easy and may our listeners, Lord God, our congregation, both in person and virtual, may they grow by the reading, the hearing, and the teaching of your word. In Jesus' name we pray that the people of God say amen. amen. You know, I was reading uh, a, a comment left on um, uh, a tweet that was put out. Uh, I don't know this person. I don't know the spirit behind what they were referring to. But it was a very provocative 
tweet, it felt like both a confession, a cry of frustration, uh, a, a narrating of their own truth, but this is what the tweet says. It said, they love us when we are dead, but they hate us when we are alive. And I was thinking about the pain in that statement, about how life can become so trivialized when we are continuously moving through the kind of roller coaster, the, 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 the regularly scheduled and unscheduled reality of death that visits our country and our people, it seems without much interruption. I mean, it is not lost upon us that we have been fighting for quite some time the systemic injustices that disproportionately visit melanated folk, low wealth folk, folk who don't find themselves fitting into the mainstream society's uh, narration of what is valuable and what is worthy. But I, I, I found the, the beating death of uh, Mr. Nichols, uh, a very young man who's actually from Sacramento who had moved to Memphis during the pandemic to, I believe, visit or be with his mother and kind of got stuck out there and stayed because he decided, you know, hey, I, I'm just gonna ride it out here. I read somewhere that he was even a, 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 a youth leader, a youth minister in his church in Sacramento and that he was suffering from Crohn's disease which meant that he had a body that was already under assault from a kind of illness and sickness that he did not ask for. It continues to remind me that for so many of us, victimization is often a reality that we did not ask for. If you are a woman, you will find throughout the course of your life, victimization will visit you in ways you did not ask for. If you are a queer person, through the course of your life, you will find victimization visiting you in ways you did not ask for. If you are a black man or a Latino man or a man of color, you will find victimization visiting you in ways you did not ask for. If you don't have a lot of money, if you somebody who is considered low of low regard, you will find victimization visiting you in ways you did not ask for. And you know, I, I, I continue to think about how easy it is to get outraged as we should about the wickedness we saw or we heard about, because I didn't watch too much of it. Amen, but I heard the the descriptions of five black police officers assaulting a man literally to death. And someone told me, well, that proves that racism was not what is at play because the officers were black. And I said, well, it helps uh, me to appreciate and hopefully all of us to appreciate that racism is more than white on black physical violence that we have a problem in this country, and dare I say, even in our own lives with human hierarchies. That we have a, 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 a predilection to, to, to uh, uh, elevate certain folks' lives over others. And when you match human hierarchy with abusive power, even those who may have some proximity to the abused may themselves become an abuser. I mean, we ought not be too surprised about the way in which violence continues to manifest even in our own communities. For if police officers can assault a young man to death, it ought to make us all feel some level of responsibility about why we assault one another to death. Why is it that within our own communities we have high rates of 
domestic and intimate partner violence that take too, much, too many times the lives of our loved ones who are women at the hands of their partners. How many of you know that's worth being outraged about? We have young men in our communities who are caught in such cycles of violence, in such cycles of lethal conflict that they themselves take the lives of one another. It is something worth being upset about. But we also have individuals who, as uh, Coretta Scott King uh, often reminds us, that uh, underfunded schools is violence. Hello, somebody. Uh, homelessness is violence. Making people work and not give them a livable wage is violence. And so while our ire rightly points towards the Memphis, Tennessee Police Department, I want to remind you that we got some of our own challenges right here in the Bay Area. I mean, it was not more than several months ago where we had to lift up our voice because the Berkeley Police Department were literally caught celebrating the ways in which they were tormenting and, and abusing the rights of our unhoused loved ones in downtown Berkeley. In the city of Memphis, they had a special uh, police unit called Scorpion, which was an acronym for them being able to use unconstitutional practices to abuse the individuals that they thought were criminal in the city of Memphis. Well, here in Berkeley, they have a bike unit that was caught uh, literally bragging about arresting people with what is called a quota, which is illegal and unconstitutional. And you have folks who cover it all up, who find a way to make light of it because of arbitrary agreements that are made that are unjust in the city of Oakland. Just in the last couple of weeks, we saw the Oakland police chief be put on uh, administrative leave with pay. Somebody say with pay. Amen. You know, he, he's a friend of mine. At least I, you know, call him a friend. Amen. And so he, he, he's on administrative pay while an investigation is going on about abuses and cover-ups of, 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 of certain kind of activities in the Oakland Police Department. Now, many of you know that, you know, the Oakland Police Department for almost 30 years has been trying to get itself together because of a case called the Oakland Riders where you have police officers literally beating black men and planting drugs on them and abusing them and the cops covering it up. Just a couple of years ago, you had uh, police officers trafficking a, a young teenage girl and the cops were covering it up. Yeah. They went through five police chiefs in one week because they couldn't find a, 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 a person to promote who was not in some way tied to the covering up. Why am I saying all this? Well, I'm saying it because the most damaging thing in my mind is that I would be willing to bet if I was a betting man some money that most of these folk engaged in these systemic abuses. If you ask them, did they go to church? Many of them would probably say yes. How would they identify religiously? Many of them would probably say, you know, I believe in God. Some of them may say I'm a Christian. Some of them may say my grandmama is the mother of my church. And it forces me and us, I believe, in this moment to ask ourselves, what is the failure of discipleship? In the Christian context where we can produce individuals who can so easily be seduced by the power within their hands and not do everything that is within our grasp to ensure justice and fairness and kindness and compassion is extended whether it costs you your job or not. What is it about how we are discipling ourselves? Because, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm someone, y'all know, you know, I, I love the rage against the machine. You know, I, 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 I borrowed a line I saw in Lean On Me. I, I like to be the Rockefeller of outrage. 
Amen. You put me in a room with some folk I think ain't doing the right thing and they're abusing and oppressing. You know, I, I'm never for a loss of words. But I found this quote from William Temple. Uh, uh, it says simply this, the worst things that happen in the world do not happen because a few people are monstrously wicked, but rather because most people are just like us. So when we grasp that, we begin to realize that our need is not merely moving quietly on in the way we are going, but our need is for radical change. Somebody say radical change. To find a power that is going to turn us into somebody else. Now, part of what I want to challenge you and I this morning on as we're coming out of a consecration, and as we're seeing the wickedness that is in the world, that at times it becomes almost like a sport these days to be upset about the wickedness that is outside of us. The wickedness that is obviously victimizing us. I want us to hold that, but I also want us to keep that same energy. When it comes to how do we ensure that we are constantly being changed into somebody else. That you may never beat somebody to death. And I'm so grateful and glad that that is the case. But there are other ways that you and I must be called to living out our faith in such a way where we are constantly an agent of God's reconciling work in the world. And that although it may cost you something along the way, you and I must be people who are known to stand up for righteousness. You and I must be people who are known to stand up for peace and kindness. You and I must be people who are known that when the rubber meets the road, we will not compromise our values because it is a little tense to take a step out of the crowd. I mean, I, I'm somebody who, 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 who understands and appreciates the mob mentality. Anybody ever been around somebody, you know, and, and, and you, know, you know it's wrong, but you, you feel a little outnumbered? You just kind of go along with it. I mean, I'm asking you to, like, put yourself out this morning. And when you get in your car, go home, you know, you can be like, man, pastor was on my road. How I many know sometimes it's kind of hard to take a step out of the crowd when the crowd gets to moving in a certain direction? How many know it's sometimes it's hard on your job to, to take a step out of that gossip, out of that, 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 you know, plotting against the person you don't like? It's a little hard when you have to take tough votes or you have to, uh, you know, uh, 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 lean in with some folk who, who are a little, you know, hard to deal with. And, you know, people like to pile on. And sometimes it requires you and I to stand up and say, you know, I refuse to go along with this unrighteousness. Sometimes the way we interrupt injustice is to stand up and say, I will not go along. Child of God, as we come on the consecration, I'm hoping that you and I can be people throughout the course of this year that will find moments in our lives where we will say, I will not go along. I hope you and I can be people when we see the, the kind of evil and wickedness that is both systemic and structural or even personal, where we will say, I will not go along. Because it is in us not going along that I believe that God's glory, God's, God's righteousness, God's power begins to be made concrete in our lives. The text then gives you and I some really powerful admonitions, powerful advice on what it looks like as we engage in these disciplines of our faith, as we eschew, reject, as we make sure that discipleship does not become lost upon us. Because I want you to know, coming to church is not the full breadth of your discipleship. Listening to me, Pastor Nish, and all the wonderful preachers who will try and break down God's word is not the full breadth of our discipleship. How many of you know that there are so many practices that you and I can engage in that can help us become fully formed after the way of Jesus? I want you to be 
a follower of Jesus, not because eternity is, 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 is your final, final kind of hang up. I want you to be a follower of Jesus because I believe if you follow the ways of Jesus, you won't beat folks to death. If you follow the ways of Jesus, you can't cheat folks. You can't harm folks. You can't treat folks as if they are disposable. It's more than just an eternal spiritual thing at stake. It's about the quality of life we have today. It means that I'm going to create a certain kind of rhythm in my life. Well, the first thing the scripture says that I lift up, I'm going to create a rhythm where I learn to forsake sin. Come on, everybody say that. Forsake sin. Say it again. Forsake sin. Now, I know when we talk about, you know, here between Normandy and Western, we talk about a little sinny, sin, sin, right? We start talking about sin, everybody gets a little tight because nobody wants to talk about the sin they struggle with. But listen, sin from a theological, categorical perspective is more than a list of things you can or cannot do. Sin, as the, 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 the theologian I, I use often, Simon Chan, he often talks about sin in three kind of categories. Some of you who've been members of the way and have sat through our discipleship process, you may be familiar with this. But we talk about sin, we say the sin within us, the sin around us, and the sin beyond us. Come on, everybody repeat after me, the sin within us. The sin around us and the sin beyond us. Come on, use your arms. I know some of y'all ain't did no exercise all week. Come on, the sin within us, the sin around us, and the sin beyond us. What I appreciate about this particular passage is that the scriptures give us a wonderful, wonderful description in the text about the kind of sin that the scripture is lifting up when we talk about the fasting. Is this not the kind of fasting that I've chosen, listen, to loose the chains of injustice? To untie the cords of the yoke. To set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry? Provide the poor wanderer with shelter. When you see the naked, to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. When I and we talk about forsaking sin, we're talking about concrete orientation to yourself, to the world, and to those forces beyond your control. Forsaking sin means that you and I take seriously our own internal struggles. Those, those, those dispositions, those attitudes, those, those vices. Y'all know what a vice is, right? A vice is something that literally strips away your own human dignity. The struggles that cause you and I to be the opposite of who God created us to be. How many of you know that you weren't created to be a person filled with violence, even though you may have been shaped in a world by violence? You weren't a person, you and I, were not people who were intended to be driven by those parts of us that we know lead us down a path that even while we're going, we know we're moving in the wrong direction. The sin within us. The question you and I must literally start asking ourselves is what are the things within me that need transforming? Who do I find too easy to hate? Who do I find too easy to disregard? How do I get used to violence being done in my name? Whether it is the violence of the tax-paying police departments, the tax-paying prisons, detention centers. Dr. King called the United States government the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. Our tax dollars being used to literally fund mercenaries and armies to wage war on the darker, poorer nations of the world. How many know we can be predisposed to find that stuff is okay as long as it does not literally directly impact me? But I want to argue 
that perhaps some of the things that happen in our name happen because we aren't dealing with the internal parts of our heart that are indeed making it easier for sin to manifest. The sin around us, the short word for that in my mind is injustice. How do you and I forsake injustice? How do you and I make sure that we are not a people who are okay with the continued expression of state violence or violence in any kind? And then the sin beyond us, that's the devil and all the devil's business. I got news for you. The sin within us, we've been given God's spirit that allows you and I to take authority over that sin. The sin around us, we've been given the, the, the gift of working for justice in the world so we can literally stomp out that expression. And the sin beyond us, how many know there's only one thing God told us to do about the devil? And that is to resist the devil. To rebuke the devil. To get the devil behind us. You and I have things we can do to forsake sin. But the quest for us is, what gets in the way? What is the sin within you which needs forsaking? What is the sin around you that needs correcting? And what is the sin beyond you that needs resisting? Everybody say forsake it, correct it, resist it. That's a formula for how we forsake sin. We forsake it. We, we literally push it away from us. We deal with the things that cause us to be susceptible. When we see injustice around us or wrong, we correct it. We don't turn a blind eye. Hello, somebody. When we are dealing with the forces of wickedness, we resist it. The scripture says that if you and I learn to resist the devil, it didn't say we have to fight with the devil, even though sometimes, you know, it's good to knock a devil up. No, I'm just playing. In the spirit, of course. But it says if you resist the devil, guess what? The devil will flee from us. Forsake sin. Correct sin. Resist sin. The second thing that the scripture lifts up for us is that even in the midst of all of these, these trials and tribulations, you and I must be people who are willing to look for the light. Somebody holler, look for the light. I want you to realize, child of God, that even in the midst of all of these, these perpetual challenges, even as you go throughout the duration of your year, there is light that is breaking forth among all of the struggles we deal with. The scripture says it very clearly that your light will break forth like the dawn. I don't know how many of you are up uh, to see the, the, the night transition to the dawn. There are a few times where I was driving cross country and, you know, I, I woke up super early to try and get from Dallas, Texas to Los Angeles. This is about a, I don't know, an 18 hour drive. And so I would wake up around four or five and it would be dark. And all of a sudden, as I'm driving for a couple of hours, I would see a little bit of light unexpectedly just break through my rear view mirror. It was something that I did not plan or expect, but when it broke through, it caught my attention. What did the dawn do? It started to light my way so I would not have to continue to strain my eyes to figure out which way I'm supposed to go. I want you to know, child of God, that the Lord is always breaking lights into your life. The Lord is always helping you to see that darkness and gloom are not the prescription for the child of God. That even when we have to go through difficulty, I want you to train your eyes to look for the light. I want you to understand that light is always waiting to break forth in your life. I want you to appreciate, as the scripture says, that the light will break forth and your healing will quickly appear. 
Lord, help me in here today. How many of you could use some healing today? How many of you could use a light that you weren't expecting and a healing to quickly appear? I hear God saying today that for some of us, we can get so caught focusing on the negative. And sometimes the negative does deserve our attention. Sometimes it's right to lament. Sometimes it's right to focus on the why and the where and the what. But I do believe that there is also a rhythm that God wants you and I to commit to. That even when it's most gloom outside, that God is saying, I got a light that is willing and able to manifest itself. Just like the night won't last always. Just like the darkness won't last always. There is a light that springs from God that can appear in our lives. If you and I can learn to look for the light. What is the light? The light is creation. The light is the good things that God has made. The light is the practices. The practices that keep reminding you that even though trouble may be on the right side, even though hardship may be on the left side, God is saying there's light there as well. There's light in the middle of your hardship. There's some joy percolating somewhere. There's some peace that's moving around somewhere. There's some glory that God is trying to get. I wonder, do I have somebody today that can look back over their life and say, I found the light when I started looking for the light. I started looking under places. I started peeking around corners. I started to train myself that even though wickedness and evil is all around me, when I begin to look up, I begin to see that God has always been there. When I begin to look down, I can see that God was holding me. God was lifting me. God was sustaining me. Do I have somebody who can testify that it was God all of the time? It was not my strength, but it was the power of the living God. And he held me up. He lifted me up. He healed my body. He fixed my mind. He gave me joy. He blessed me with peace. It was God. That reminded me that light and life and possibility are always present if I can look for it. If I can train myself to be on the lookout for the light of God. The scripture says in its conclusion one simple thing that you and I will be called repairers of the breach inhabitors of spaces and places where we can live. We will restore the ancient ruins. There is something powerful about we who lean into these practices that you will start to uncover strength in places you did not know you had. The strength needed to restore ancient ruins is found in our capacity to engage the disciplines. You may not build, rebuild some of the things that you thought needed rebuilding. God will give you the strength to build something else. You may not find joy in the place you thought joy lived, but you will find joy in another place. You may not find what you thought your life was going to be, but you will find, as the children of Israel found, an opportunity to create again. 
the great thing about following the ways of Jesus is that new life does not have an expiration date on it. But as long as we keep walking, being discipled, being transformed, glory can be unleashed. Come on, let's stand and let's take a moment to pray. Those who are being baptized and need to prepare yourselves, man, go ahead and start your preparation. Amen. Following our altar call, we're going to move quickly into a time of the sacramental practice of baptism. But you that are looking for the glory of God to be unleashed, grab someone by the hand or touch them on their shoulder, on their arm if they feel okay about it. And it is through our connection together that power and strength is expanded and extended. So God, in the name of Jesus, we ask you, Lord, bless our loved one whom we're touching. I pray, God, that you will cause them to imagine the personal, communal, and dare I even say the spiritual sins that require our attention, our forsaking, our correction, and dare I even say our resisting. I pray, God, that you will help us look for light in places where gloom persists. I pray, God, that we will be people who will not go along with evil, go along with wickedness, but that we will be the sources of righteousness and justice in the world. I pray, God, for the healing that is needed in our own lives, the healing that is needed in our spiritual, relational, family, communal lives. God, may that healing break forth in a powerful and in a mighty way. Now lift your hands where you stand. God, it's me and I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother. It is not my father, my sister, or my brother, but it is me, oh Lord, and I need you, God. I need you, Lord, to remind me of your power. Remind me, God, of your salvation. Remind me, God, of the power and the hope that is the reality of those who walk in your light. God, I pray that the light of love will break forward today in a mighty way. And we'll say, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Hug two or three people and tell them, come on, let's walk in the light together. Let's walk in the light together.